Tax Choice. According to Apple, it's seven o'clock. So we will get this um, special meeting of the Board of Selectmen on March 2nd um, called to order. And we will get right into the budget. And first up are the registrars of voters. And I'm gonna spotlight um, the folks who are gonna be having a conversation with us. If you give me just a second. So we have Therese, we have Karen. Just lost track of Therese. That everyone from your office for registrars. Hi, Sal. <laughs> Karen, you're on uh, mute. <laughs> here we go okay now we're all here thank you <laughs> so um we're gonna turn the meeting over to you all to review your um budget proposal Teresa, you want to take it um, I've never done this before, so I don't know what exactly the format is. How would you like me to sure. begin? Yeah, if you want to just walk through the budget worksheet that was um, submitted, that would be great. Okay, um, well, maybe we should begin with um, this year's budget reflected um, two elections. This coming year's budget at the moment reflects three elections. So there's already a, a huge increase in our budget. Um, Karen has um, stated that she's going to resign at the end of June. And that puts the person taking her place will have to do the um, Oh, um, training. All the yeah, all the training, um, which is the hours as well as um, the the amount of money that has to be spent for um, for the actual training. So it's the hours and the tuition, if you so to speak. Um, the Let's see, the supplies um, has an increase due to inflation, as well as the extra, at least one extra um, election. And, uh, and we won't really know whether it's only one election. We are assuming it will only be one election. That's the only thing that right now we have on the books, but um, as we know, we could always have more. So um, this budget looks at um, three elections. Um, the postage will stay the same, the notices will stay the same, the mileage stays the same, um, the election refreshments has a modest increase of $100 um, due to inflation, that's, um, that's what we came up with, I'm, I'm sure that it would, it, it may be more than that, but at that's what we're projecting. Um, the dues will stay at $200. The conference fees um, we have budgeted at um, $2,500, which is the same. And um, the training has an increase as well. We proposed that um, the registrars have an extra hour per week of work um, that's due to an increase from the state in what our expectations are to do the job. Um, we have extra hours for the deputy registrars um, due to an increase in um, 
in the number of elections, as well as the workers and the moderators. And that's um, pretty well, pretty much our budget. Are there any questions? We did ask for an increase of 50, up to, to $15 an hour for the uh, poll workers who are now making $13 an hour, I believe it is. I think so it's $13.99. Just... They're making $14 an hour and we asked for an increase to 15 to match the state minimum wage. And can you just um, sort of talk about the poll workers there? They have a very long day. <laughs> um, hey, well, uh, we start an election, general election at five o'clock in the morning. Voting ends at eight, provided that there aren't any people still in line. Otherwise it goes on until the last person has, who was in line at eight o'clock votes. And then there's paperwork and things that has to be done after that. So they're working anywhere from a 15 hour to an 18 hour day. And then if there's any problems that could go on longer than that. Um, it is a, a long tedious day. Some, in some instances they can break it up and we can have somebody, two people doing a half day each, but that does make for bookkeeping problems sometimes. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a long day, it's a tedious day, and it's a very important position, especially the, the checker. Um, the checkers, all the numbers at the end of the night are supposed to match the checkers numbers, the number of ballots that were given out, and the number of ballots that actually went through the machine. So those all have to match at the end of the night and, and help God help us if they don't. Because uh, it takes a lot of time to figure out where that transposed number was. <laughs> How many poll workers are there, roughly? Uh, basically, we only have three at an election. That would be the checker, the person who hands out the ballots, ballot clerk, and the tab tabulator tender are the ones who are considered poll workers. And then on top of that, we have the assistant registrars and the moderator. And there's two assistant registrars. And for a big election like we're going to have this fall in November, which will be the state office election, we'll have two of each of those because we're going to need that to be able to get people through there fast enough so you're not getting long lines outside. So we'll have double the number of people. Plus we have a primary, which is most likely going to be a double primary which means the Democrats will have one and the Republicans will have one. We do them both at the same time in the same room so we can share a moderator and we can share a um, tabulator tender. But, and we can, if it's a small enough number, we can get away with not having a ballot clerk. We can have the checker do both of those jobs, but we still need two checkers. Um, and then we have a referendum that at the, in May of every year, which is a half day, which is a little bit easier job that has a, a full complement, except we can sometimes get away without a checker. So those are the three elections you talked about, the referendum, right. the federal. Those are the three we know we're going to have. If we, we could have a, a runoff election after the after the primary and we could have a runoff election after the, um, or, or a recount after the uh, general election. One year when I worked, we had seven referendums because they couldn't pass the budget. So, and the town could decide to have another referendum. We didn't budget for any more than just one. Um, <laughs> but there, you know, the, all those other things are possibilities that could show up that we haven't got in that budget. We could also get have to have an audit for either the primary or the election. We have not yet been pulled out of the hat for an audit, but it's going to happen someday. So, in the um, on the budget worksheet, there's 
um, there's a table that looks like it was entered, um, but then there's some handwritten notes. And I just want to make sure that we're understanding the, the one that was um, entered on the spreadsheet. It says registrar times two, rate of 2393, hours per diem three, 52 weeks, extra hours 109, and then handwritten next to that says each. So that's per registrar. Um, I believe so, but that tree yeah. should be those figures, right? Right, uh, it is per registrar, yes. Okay. We currently work now three hours a week. That's what we're supposed to be working off and it's more than that. And then we're for an election, the week, the Tuesday before that election, we're required to be in our office from nine in the morning until eight o'clock at night to register voters. The day before the election, we're supposed to be here from nine to five. For an election, we have to be here at five o'clock in the morning and then um, finish whenever we finish. And oftentimes that's around midnight. Uh, for, there's also another time we're required to be in the office for two hours. So those are state mandated hours that we absolutely have to be in, to, in the office. Um, and then uh, beyond that, I mean, like right now we're in the middle of the canvas season and in order to get all the letters and things out on, in a reasonable length of time so people have time to get them back to us and then we have time to follow up if we need to, um, we put in extra hours. When we go to a conference, we only get paid $35 a day for the three days of, of the conference. So it's, at, uh, on those we're losing money. <laughs> Say that again. And so when we go to a conference, we get, we get paid $35 a day to go to that conference. That's, that's what the state has agreed, made an agreement with the towns. Um, when I had a dog, it cost me more than that to just have somebody watch my dog while I was, at the conference, plus we bought our, except for breakfast and lunch, we, if we stayed, we had to pay for our own uh, dinner, so. Um. Also the uh, certification for the registrars, there's a, eight different sections. And a lot of the sections, I don't even put my uh, hours in for studying and reviewing the videos that they show. So it's, it's actually significant more time commitment for the certification and it's outlined in the worksheet. But you put in your hours for that, right? No, no, I just, in other words, I might put in hours just for reviewing it once, but when I review it four or five times, I don't put those additional hours in. Or I, have, or I, or I haven't been. You, you have to take, the class and then after the class you take a a, a quiz. quiz right so there's there's eight sections um they're all two and, two to three hours each right but i might review each of the video sections you know three four times each before right. i take the quiz and so, you're lucky we didn't have that option <laughs> right and i i i didn't put that on my time sheet any of that yeah. i mean maybe just once but it's it's a the certification process is pretty involved. Yeah, so then you, at the end of, when you finish all of those classes then you have to take a hundred question exam on the entire 18 hours. <laughs> it is open book, but you have to have all the printouts and things with you if you want. And you have to pass it with, I think if it's a 94 or something like that, you have to pass it with. And that's all in statute. That's all in statute, yeah. Plus you have to have an, a registrar's have to have an additional 10 hours of training approved by the Secretary of State each year. It's the conferences, a lot of the training that we get at the conferences counts as that, but the Secretary of State's now offering special classes. And we've, I've been taking one 
all year on cybersecurity. They send a little half hour class section each every couple mm -hmm. of months, every month or so. Mm -hmm. So looking at the the sheet, and I don't, you know, Glenn Rufus, by all means, I don't want to monopolize the time. Um, in one place, it says four hours per week, but then um, it says that it works out to six and a half hours a week for plus minus each registrar. I just want to make sure I understand this. I think that's if you were to add up all the hours that we did and divide it by a week, it would come out, it would average that much. But they're asking for an extra hour a, a, a week at the in the office, paid in the office on a regular basis as in, instead of three hours, make it four. Because when we're getting ready for an election, there's an, a lot of work that has to be done. Mm -hmm. um, and you can't get it all done in three hours. So you're not actually asking for increased pay for the registrar. You're just putting in more hours. Right. So the only increase is to bring the workers up to $15 an hour. That and I, I think we all, everybody gets a, a, a what is it, a 2% increase every year, whatever that is the normally. Of, so the 2393 in, includes a 6% increase or that's what the old one was? No, that's the old yes. number. 2393 is what we're getting now. Okay. We're getting that. The deputy registrars get 1829. The workers get 1399. And the moderator gets 2029. So, and the moderator has one of the harder, harder jobs at the election because she's in charge of everything. Whatever happens is the responsibility to handle when they're down there. So the moderator is part of the workers line in the. Oh, uh, no. The moderator is, is, is the head election official at an election. I understand that, but you have registrar and deputies and you have workers. There are two lines. Well, the deputy but registrars, the purpose of the deputy registrar is to take over in case the registrar isn't here for whatever reason. And they also act as the assistant registrars during an election or as a, a poll worker downstairs. Well, I'm not, I'm not questioning. The, the workers we're talking about are the tabulator tender the, the, the all i was asking is where the moderator's salary is placed in one of those two lines it's placed in the elections i there I are, think Aaron, I've, there are two lines yeah there's she'll be under for registrar and deputies and there's a line for workers it's under workers okay that's all i asked that's all i needed to know thank right. you I, I don't think that's correct. The moderator is, at least on my, the, the paper that I have, the moderator shows separate from the workers. And they are- Not, are not on, not on, if you look on the top row there, Teresa, it just says- my, um, Oh, at the top. Okay, I was looking at deputies and workers, yes. So they're, they're, they're lumped in with the workers, but they have a, a separate pay rate. Yeah, I just all I wanted to know was where the moderator was. And so I, you know. Yeah. Um, well, I understand what you're talking about now. Yeah. I was looking at the bottom where it was separated. Yeah, no, no. 
yeah, down at the bottom, it's just sort of a worksheet. Yeah, the worksheet is worksheet. a little confusing to try to follow because it doesn't have your proposed total numbers or anything like that. Because we never know what the what the percentage increase will be, so we can't put in. We just tell you what the increase in the hours will be. Right, that's fine. <clears throat> and next year it'll go down because we won't have three elections. Very, very, we won't be having a primary very likely. Although it's possible, but next year is a town election, and we generally don't have primaries for town elections although it's not out of the realm of possibility. And can you just um, talk a little bit about the supply line? The what? The supply line, what's included in, because your what's included in your supplies is a little bit different. You know, it's not just office supplies. Well, a lot of that goes for ballots. We, the town clerk orders the ballots and the town clerk figures what's going to be on them, but we pay for the printing of them. It covers um, the coding for all of the machines that we, uh, voting machines that we use, the tabulators and the machines, the, uh, the what we call the IVS machine, which is for people who are disabled. It's a printer in it and a, tablet and all those have to be coded so that they can can read and print what needs to be read and printed um, and they're expensive um, the other thing we have the expenses we have are um, tons of paper oh, the official voter list right now runs 40 some odd pages every time we print one. So we go through reams of paper on a regular basis. And we, when we're doing elections, we use three whole papers. So otherwise we're gonna be punching it so they'll fit in our notebooks. Um, what else do we, uh, there's equipment that we need to buy uh, this year we're going we're going to be adding some new um, voter stanchions. The ones that we have are falling apart, and the state's not replacing them. And so we we've already bought four. We'll be buying four more. They they actually come as as it was one full unit. They roll out. They unfold. They fold. They, you've got four of them right there, and they have curtains for privacy, and they're all set. It takes us, the length of time it takes us to set up one voting booth we have now, we can set four up in, in the same period of time. It's much, and it takes up less space so we can space them out better and use the small space that we have uh, more efficiently. <clears throat> supplies, I'm trying to think, we're, well, office supplies, any kind of office supplies that we would need. We also pay um, uh, for um, the main maintenance of the machinery that we have. We have, paid, we have a, a um, contract with the company, LHS, that does the tabulators. And they come out once a year and service the machines. But if any parts have to be replaced or whatever, uh, some of that re will require a purchase on our part, like batteries and things like that. Thank you. Any questions, Glenn? Any more questions, Rufus? No, I, I don't have any more questions. I would like to say to Karen, thank you for your many, many, many years doing this. It's only been eight. <laughs> <laughs> it was eight five years ago. <laughs> no, it's eight, 2013, I think it was. <laughs> True. I got snuckered into it too because I got asked to be the deputy, and then then the registrar decided to get married and move out of town. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, thanks, Karen, Tree, Sal, for being here tonight to present this. Appreciate it. 
um, and we're going to unspotlight you. <laughs> and um, I will spotlight next Darlene. So give me just a second. Uh, I know that was. Um, hi, Dar. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hello, oh, Dar. Hello, everybody. Got one sec. We got bumped off there. I think we're back to four. Yes. Thanks for joining us. And okay. I'm going to turn right over to you. So most of my lines have stayed flat. Um, there are no increases. The supply line, um, although it's 100%, it went from 200 to 400, just because my actual has been running over just a bit every year. So I've tried to make um, recognition to that. The other line that there was an adjustment with the reduction was my conference line. That was with looking at that, um, looking ahead at the dates. I know that for the 22-23 year, that there will be one of those um, conferences I will not be able to attend. So I've already reduced that in the line. That, so Again, that might mean the following year it will go back up, but there's no reason to put that slight amount of money in the in the budget line. Um, so the adjustment, um, the other increase would be salary, and that was um, put in with the six percent cola. Um, I truly hope that the board of selectmen put a lot of time into um, discussing, evaluating. Um, really put a lot of reflection into what these salary requests mean. Um, not only do they mean to us individually, what they mean to the profession and what they mean to um, respond to the respect of the work that has been done and the work that will be continued to be done going forward. Um, so, um, I hope that when you schedule your budget meetings going forward, because there's been no discussion about the salary line, um, that that is a specific topic with time put aside and that it doesn't come down to, and I'm on record as saying this in past years, and I'll say it again, that unfortunately it always comes down to the last minute. And we are... Um, that line gets discussed last minute and it becomes the compromise line because it all of a sudden becomes the number that you decide to, oh, we need to shift that, move that, and um, other things have already been put into stone and that salary line gets juggled. Um, I really, really um, ask of all of you, all the three of you, to remember the positions that it represents, the work that has been done and the continued work um, going forward um, that we have all put our um, names to those jobs. So any questions? Thank you, darling. Thank sure. you. Sorry, I was, I had myself on mute. Can you just um, speak just briefly about the record maintenance so you, obviously maintain all of the, the records that come into your office. And um, just to give us a little bit more information about that. Sure, that expense line um, specifically represents a contract with IQS, which is the vendor who manages my land records program. Um, so any type of recordings that come into the town clerk's office um, nat naturally are indexed, digitized, and um, they also oversee the online access that is web, um, web page driven. So that 12,000 represent a $900 a month um, fee. And it's a contract, I believe it's a five-year contract of which I'm in my third year. 
um, the remaining balance of that line is that they do a verification. So for audit purposes, they go in and if I'm spelling um, Sanchez wrong, they check it They and they give us daily and weekly reports to make sure that they um, review that information so that I can then correct it. So at all times, there's a secondary to, and then even a third review of the information. That's what record maintenance line is. And is IQS sort of the, um, the, the <laughs> I don't know, more delicate way to say this, the only game in town kind of scenario because it's state? No. Know, I okay. mean, it's state. It's it's a state vendor. It's a vendor that's approved by the state. Um, mm -hmm. Pot Systems is another. Um, I, there's another. So there's um, a few to. to there's a few to from. go to. I, that's good. I changed from Cot probably eight years ago. Cot had been the only land record system that the town of Kent had used, and I had opted to change over. Um, it was based on the program that they were offering, but also the cost. So, and it's worked out very well and our customer service base is, is very strong. Great. You also, um, you get a grant, right? For, it doesn't have to do with that records maintenance or it does have to do. Um, it, it do no, the grant that we, um, the, it's uh, statute driven. It's based, it's historic preservation grant. Um, I, I would be wrong in telling you it when what year it was probably 1997 I believe is when the state decided to increase the cost of land record fees the filing fee and of of that filing fee a portion of it then gets submitted to the state they operate this historic preservation grant um, they're the ones who divvy up the money amongst small medium and large towns we are allocated uh, anywhere between 3,000, sometimes it's 5,000, sometimes it's been 7,500. And so annually we're used, um, as long as I apply, um, we're, um, it's basically guaranteed that money. Um, I have digitized more records so that my land records go back to 1930 online. So you can look at the images. I have made sure some of the books from um, 19, early 1900s, late 1800s, have been um, preserved. And I've also made sure other books have been um, actually bounded, covered, and basically repaired. Um, I've bought file cabinets, I've bought special shelving, um, and I've also paid for somebody to come in. Um, one year it was an actual, somebody came in and did like an internship and she was paid through that grant money. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Thanks, Darlene. Thank you, Darlene. You're welcome. And the, just one last question. For the assistant, there's an asterisk on the worksheet, and then that goes down to detail. Um, is it still two part-time? I have two part-time assistant. assistants. Yep. Okay, so that, that's rolled up into that box at the bottom the two people. That's correct. Okay. Thanks. All righty. Any other questions, Glenn Rufus, Darlene? I would just right. like to ask that I hear a commitment that from the three select and that time will be put aside for that salary discussion. Yes. Sure. Yep. yes. I would like to discuss salary. Uh, Darlene, you have, you're the first one who's put down 5.9%. It's not a big deal. Uh, it's like $57 that difference, um, but most people put down 6%. What is the exact COLA? I believe that when I looked it up, COLA is 5.9%. Um, yeah. I think it was just taken to do a rounding factor when the document was prepared to just put 6% across the board for all the different um, departments. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. But 
$57 does matter. So it's okay if you look at it as 6%. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Dar. Thanks. Uh, let's see. Donna is up next. Donna, do you usually do, um, how, how would you like to proceed? Would you like me to spotlight you and planning and zoning and then do inland wetlands? You tell me who um, you'd like me to spotlight. Um, you can spotlight Lynn and um, Wes and Matt, please. Okay. One second. What lines are we looking at here? Uh, planning and zoning starts at one one five three. Okay. And then it just follows down uh, planning and zoning, and then it does uh, ZBA inland wetlands and the uh, building official because I have I do the yep. budgets for all four. Okay. We got everybody. Wes, Matt, Lynn. Hi. 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 Hello. Hi, everybody. Alrighty. Um, so I'll start with ZBA since that's actually the easiest ones to go through. Um, we don't usually get a lot of applications for ZBA, which means that our regulations are doing the job that they're supposed to be doing. Um, so I, I put myself, or not myself, the clerk in for an increase of um, 6% because that is what COLA is. And historically, the Board of Selectmen have used COLA um, as the reason for an increase. Um, my supplies I left um, at 100. Um, postage went up a little bit because there was a postage increase. My postage rates aren't really that high um, because I have a postage meter and I pay five cents less um, for each one of my letters that goes out. Um, and then I dropped down my notices from five to $400 just based on history. Um, I'm required to, um, to notice uh, almost everything that I do for all three of my departments in the newspaper um, and legal notices. So, um, but since we haven't been getting that many applications, I really haven't been having many notices in the newspaper. So that's ZBA. If anybody has any questions about that. No, thank you. Thank you. Right. Who is, are you? You're the clerk or do you have a, do you have a separate clerk? No, I'm the clerk for ZBA. Okay. Um, for the building department, um, again, um, there was a 6% uh, increase um, for the building clerk. Um, the way that the building clerk is charged, 50% um, of the building clerk's salary is charged to the building department. 40% of that salary is charged to planning and zoning. 10% of that salary is charged to inland wetlands because that building clerk would be responsible for all three departments as well. Um, the supplies, I upped a little bit. Um, I'm hoping to start cleaning out the building files. They are a mess and I cannot get one more piece of paper in there. Um, postage again went up. The um, state education fund went up just based on past history. Uh, the state education fund is driven by the amount of fees that come into the town with each in particular um, application. Um, the dues um, actually did go up from 150 to, um, to 175. <clears throat> so that is building. And what is the um, state education fund? What is that? So there's money that, that comes out of your permit fees and goes into a special fund at the state level. The education what, fund, fund education. Just in general, it's like a general fund mm -hmm. for education. Okay. Yep. And I believe that gets paid um, on a quarterly basis. <clears throat> um, the proposed revenue um, I did raise from 18,000, which is budgeted for this year up to 22. And I did that based on conversations with Joe and based on the past history. If you look at it right now, um, this was year to date. I don't know when Barbara printed these sheets, but um, we were already at $15,000 and we still have six months more to go. Um, and that's just an indication 
of the increase, not only in the number of permits, but in the construction value of what's being built at this point in time. Um, so um, they were hoping that we'll be able to uh, surpass the revenue like we have in the past two years. Um, just as an FYI, <clears throat> um, I did do an analysis <clears throat> for building for fiscal year 18, 19, um, we had a construction value of $13 million um, and we processed a number of 490 permits. For fiscal year 1920, the construction value was $37,773,000 with number of permits processed 424. And for fiscal year 2021, the construction value was a little bit lower at $31.2 million with a number of permits at 584. Um, so you can see that the building department has been extremely busy um, in, in its process. Any questions on building? Guess not. No. Sorry, I sorry I muted myself again. Um, the I wasn't writing it down quickly enough. The uh, value for eighteen nineteen and then nineteen twenty. I got the number of permits, but I didn't catch the value. So the construction value for 1819 is $13,281,156. And for fiscal year 1920, $37,773,498. Thank you. All set, I can move on. I think so. I'm just doing one more scan. I don't think I have any other questions on that one. Anybody else? Glenn, yours with? No. Okay. Um, I'll go into um, the building department. I'm sorry, planning and zoning rather. Um, <clears throat> with the planning and zoning, um, I did double my supplies. Um, right now we're in the process of um, working on a scanning project. I'm trying to scan all of my site plans to get them out of the draws. I just don't have enough room. We're putting them in boxes. So I'm purchasing additional boxes that have to go downstairs um, into the basement. And then that will enable every map block and lot to have a scan file um, that will provide information digitally on site plans, building permits, building plans, um, so that that information can be accessed on a digital basis. Someone should come in and is looking for something. We can print it out or email it to them. Um, so uh, I'll need the supplies to do that. And then just trying to reorganize the draws. I have no more draw space and I have no more space for cabinets. So um, I've gone ahead and doubled the budget in order to do that. For postage again, I just increased the postage because the postage rate went up. Notices, um, I kept the same at $2,000. Um, that's basically based on um, past history so far. I'm hoping that they're going to change the way that we noticed um, decisions that are made by commissions. Um, now I am required to put notices in the newspaper. I'm hoping um, that there is going to be a push that we can keep our notices the way that we have during COVID where they weren't required to be put in the newspaper, um, just posted on the website. Um, I'm hoping that that's gonna continue on and it would be a really good way to save some money for the town. Uh, printing and mapping, I actually popped up a little bit mostly because um, we're in the middle of doing the plan of conservation and development and we might have some new maps that are gonna be coming out of that process. So I need a little bit of extra money just to print some off. Um, for engineering, it stayed at a thousand. Engineering is, um, we, we contact anchor engineering, but the way that our um, ordinances are set up, um, we can charge back the engineering fee to the applicant. So it's, that would just be costs that I would incur if I need to get in touch with an engineer. Um, planning, I did up, um, I think 
probably um, Matt and, and Wes will think that maybe we need a little bit more there. Um, but the reason that I bump that up is because um, I am planning on retiring in September um, and there will be um, a new person sitting at my desk who might need to rely on a planner a little bit more than I do at this point in time. So I just wanna make sure that that information is available um, or there's at least funds in there for, for the new person to actually have conversations with a planner. Um, our, um, the dues have remained the same. Conferences have remained the same. Casio, um, their conferences are only $35 um, and we, they're going to try to start doing a little bit more because we are now required by the state to be certified. Um, and I am required to um, participate and, and receive a continuing education credits. So, but they're going to keep the cost down. So that's not going to, I don't believe that that's going to change. Um, for training, I did bump it up again, like I said, um, up to $1,000. And that would be for the new person. Um, and um, I also bumped the salary for both the new zoning enforcement officer and the new clerk um, by 6%. I think the only way that you're gonna end up getting someone to fill the spot that I'm leaving, um, the 6% is a warranted price or salary increase. Um, and that kind of has been proven by you guys twice already with the hiring of the park and rec director um, and also with the conversion of the social services director from a part-time position to a full-time position with benefits. So um, if you're gonna wanna be in the ball game um, and be able to hire someone that is already trained, is someone that's gonna hit the ground running, you're gonna need to be paying a higher salary. Um, so that is planning and zoning. And then when I, I'll do um, inland wetlands at this point in time. Um, and then you guys, um, I'll, I'll turn it over or you can ask questions and then um, Lynn and Wes um, can also make some comments. So for wetlands, same thing. I increased um, salary 6% again, because I'm leaving. Um, supplies stayed the same. The 350 for postage went up. Um, notices stayed the same, mileage, you know what, I, mileage is there. I never charge it, um, but the next person might. Printing and mapping stayed about the same at 150. So there, this was a pretty flat. Um, typically what I do with um, any kind of postage that comes in um, or even in my supply line, I divide it by four. So because my supplies get used by ZBA, by Inland Wetlands, by the building department and by planning and zoning. So it gets split by four every time I get something in. So that's about it with my worksheets. Great. Thanks, Donna. Um, the, you know, we'll um, hand off to Wes and Lynn and Matt, and then we'll go to questions. Okay. Can you all hear me? Yes, thanks. Okay, okay, great. I'm on my phone, because uh, my, my microphone on my computer. Uh, I guess I, I just want to say thanks to Donna um, and also thanks to um, Darlene um, and echo her comments about the cost of living increase. I know the Board of Selectmen has um, typically relied on the on the COLA to in thinking about you know salaries. In this particular case, though, too, I also wanted to add a few things. Um, you know, as Donna mentioned, we need we really do need to get this land use. Um, administrator salary in line with what the, what the position and what our skilled professional staff is worth, based both on what the job requires and also what the going rate is for similar positions around, um, you know, communities near us. And, you know, first, you all know that the land use administrator is a trained, certified, and professional position. Um, it, this position really does require a working knowledge of state statute, and even more importantly, a working knowledge of case law, which is changing monthly. Um, those decisions uh, really do guide the way that your volunteer land use commission should be looking at applications and making decisions. Um, so in many ways, that land use administrator position 
is our first line of defense, both us, the volunteers, and the town in total, against lawsuits stemming from errors made in decision-making or in procedural um, management of applications. So it becomes critically important that this person is skilled, trained, and experienced. That's what we have in Donna, um, and, and that's what we want to keep. Um, in addition, as I think Donna mentioned, the, you know, the workload has increased dramatically. Um, when we first were hiring for a full-time professional land use administrator, we were looking at 30 to 35 hours a week. By the time Donna came on board, that was a steady 35 hours a week. And in the last few years, that has grown to a 40 or more hours a week, which is normal for a professional position, um, but she's not being paid for that time. Um, we need to really pay, you know, what the job is worth and what our staff is worth. And in Kent right now, we're actually paying a lot less than many of the towns near us, um, significantly less if you compare the job hourly. So uh, we looked at Salisbury, we looked at Warren, we looked at Washington, we looked at Cornwall, and our land use administrator is making far less um, than they are on an hourly basis. And, you know, as, as, as Donna mentioned, in the very near future, we're going to be looking to hire a new professional uh, land use administrator, and we will be seeking someone who is trained and skilled and experience and can hit the ground running. Um, not only because the workload's increasing, but also because the complexity of the job is increasing. I think Kent has, in my experience and what I've heard from applicants, one of the best land use offices in our region. Um, there is always availability to deal with the public. There is knowledgeable dealing with the public. There is a friendly, helpful approach to dealing with the public. The, that outward-facing office accomplishes a tremendous amount. Everybody in town hall does a great job, but my experience is with the land use office. Um, and then internally, as a chairman of a commission who has to go to court when we are sued, it is incredibly comforting to know that the record that we are basing our actions on is up-to-date in terms of the statutes that we need to follow, and the procedures and case law that are coming out of courts on a regular basis. Um, that is very comforting to me. So as we look to the future, we're gonna to wanna to replace Donna with somebody who has her capabilities. Um, and so we really do need to, to elevate that salary so that we can attract somebody like Donna who is experienced and skilled. Um, we're, we're you know, we're not really going to be in a position to do a lot of training, I guess, is, is, is my sense of where we're at right now with land use in Kent and all around the region. So um, I just wanted to kind of set that stage a little bit. We're very grateful to Donna and, um, and to everybody in town hall. And again, echo what, um, what Darlene said in terms of the way that you think about salary increases. Yes, it's the cost of living increase. Yes but it is also a way to get our professional position in our land use office in Kent up to par with the other land use offices in the towns around us. That's it. Uh, Lynn, uh, following up on what you were just talking about, um, do you, could you, would it be possible for you to put together um, sort of a table of actual figures and what you think would be the type of salary that you're talking about, sort of in, in concrete numbers rather than, you know, I mean, you're, I understand what you're saying. And that this is what happened when we went looking for a park and rec director, you know, to get somebody we wanted, we had to increase the salary. So, I, yeah. you know, I think it would help myself and maybe, Gene and Glenn, if you gave us a ballpark of what you think that really means ongoing. Uh, yeah, absolutely. We, we can do that. Um, Donna and the Council of Governments at one point pulled together a salary survey. Um, it is not, it's not an apples to apples survey because some people make a certain salary and they work 35 hours a week or some people 
uh, work in an office where they have three other people doing the job that we do with essentially one person. Um, so it would take a little bit of time, but yes, I think we can figure that out. I can tell you that I believe that the request that's in there right now is a minimum of what we will need going forward, um, primarily because of the very tight job market in the state of Connecticut. And, and everybody I know who's been searching for people has had to increase their expectation about, about what they were going to offer. Um, that includes the state of Connecticut, which has ratcheted up its entry-level positions. And by entry-level, I mean entry-level. I'm not talking experience. Um, but, yes, we can, we can pull together the figures that Donna has given us based on reality today. can't really guess about what the job market will bear in four months. Because uh, unless we find somebody who had to hire and is recently hired, we can look at that as well. And we'll look for right. that. See, I think you have uh, probably, uh, you know, you, your knowledge of the different towns and how they're set up. And, you know, like you said, it's, it's not always apples to apples. So a little bit of explanation, you know, would help us or help me. I would appreciate that. I think Hog is about to come out with a new, with their new survey for last year as well. They do one annually, and CCM does one as well. Um, yeah, I would caution you. I've seen the, the last Hog, right. um, and it listed Donna as thirty hours a week. That is absolutely inaccurate. Inaccurate. We hired for thirty-five, and her job has grown to forty or over. But. Be that as may, we will take the information we have and and bring it up to speed. Great. Wes, well, thanks I can't, for joining us. I can't say uh, more than what was said uh, by Donna and Lynn, but I want I want to thank Donna for her incredibly thorough uh, work on this commission. As a, as a professional working in this town as well, I can tell you how important it is to have uh, an office th that you can get, get immediate information out of. Um, and, and the number of, app, it, it really, it's the scope of work. Uh, there's an extraordinary amount of important work that comes through this office, not only in buildings, but uh, 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 also uh, Torrington Area Health, works through here, as well as the building department in wetlands, uh, uh, the Board of Appeals. It is a, it is a big position with, a, with a, a great deal of responsibility. Um, and uh, um, again, Donna has set a, a great standard here and, uh, and, and we need to keep the ball rolling here when, when, when she leaves. Thanks, Wes. Matt, did you want to offer a comment? Wes, if I may, I'll, I'll, I'll just I'll say a couple of things. Yeah, of course. Um, so with regard to the, to, to the printing lines, um, I think that the, the, the scanning of the documents, you know, if we, to get into the nitty gritty, the scanning of the documents is a, having those documents electronic, um, electronically, for, for transmission electronically, is really very helpful to, this, to the all volunteer um, planning and zoning commission. I'm sure it's really helpful to um, to Lynn's commission as well. Um, we, you know, all of us are working full time jobs, and we don't have the time to go by the town hall and and, and ask Donna to pull those files and look at them there. If we if we can get those documents transmitted to us electronically, it's it's really very helpful and it helps us do our job much more efficiently. Um, with the increase in the planning line, um, you know, Donna's right that there's there's going to be some uh, um, some effort needed and some support needed for her replacement, but also um, for us going forward, we, 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 we have to update um, our, our regulations on, on somewhat of a continual basis. Um, and we have, to, we have to update our um, subdivision regulations coming up soon. So that, so that, 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 planning, um, that planning value is really important. Um, and I'll, 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 I'll remind everybody that um, the, the governor has um, enacted, I'm not quite sure where, well, I'm going to call it a law. It's, a, it's something. The governor has said that we all have to be trained um, starting in, in 2023. So all the, all the land use commissioners are going to have to go through some 
I'll, I'll call it significant. Um, certainly a, an effort to be um, trained to the level that the, the governor wants us to be. Um, so I think that everything outside of the salary, all, all of those, all of those increases are are really important. Um, and then the salary, I'll just spend two minutes and say, I've been involved in this process not a tremendous number of years, but a few. And every year, the the selectmen, the town, I'll, I'll say that every every year, the town has elected to simply offer a cost of living increase. Um, I, I personally don't think that that's right. I think that everybody who works in the town hall works tremendously hard. Everybody who's public facing, who I work with um, as, a, as a volunteer and as a, a community member, they're, 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 they're all terribly well qualified and they're all terribly helpful. Um, so I think that they should get paid for the, for the work that they do. Um, but I understand that the town has this philosophy that they, they want to increase the increase the wages based on cost of living. Um, and they've been they, they've been following this plan for at least as long as I've been um, involved in this budget process. So at the very least, I think to be fair, um, the town should follow in their own footsteps and and offer this cost of living increase, which um, which turns out this year to be 6%. You know, the pandemic has really turned us all on our heads. Um, the, there's tremendous inflation, 6%. If you're not gonna do it the one way, you should definitely do it the other way. Um, and the last thing I'll say is um, as close as we can get to a comparable position um, from a salary standpoint, um, working 40 hours a week, um, the land use administrator um, in, I said in Salisbury, right, makes 82, $82,800 a year. Um, with this increase that we're asking for, for the land use administrator and, and, and the varying roles in Lynn Wetlands Planning and Zoning or Building Department, um, Zoning Board of Appeals, with the 6% with the COLA increase, that brings it to 72, so $10,000 less than what they're paying in Salisbury for a, for a, a, a seemingly a, a comparable position. So that's my pitch. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Um, Donna, can you just expand a little bit on the planning line? What that sort of what what um, what happens? What that planning line means? Um, so um, we have a planner that we've been dealing with for the past couple of years. He wrote our plan of conservation and development. His name is Glenn Talder. Um, he also was one who was very instrumental in the rewriting of our zoning regulations. So anytime we have a tweak to our zoning regulations or we are thinking about tweaking them, um, we do tap into him periodically and say, what do you think about this? And what are other towns doing? And can you give me a little bit of guidance um, on the wording of how we should be um, bringing this forward so that we don't end up getting sued? Um, he does cost us money, but he costs us a little bit less money than it would cost for me to talk to Mike Ziska, who is our um, planning attorney. So um, Got it. That would be, that's the person that I would be tapping into for that. Awesome. That, that's very helpful. Mm -hmm. Great. Anything else, Glenn Rufus? Well, I guess... Uh... I should also extend my thanks to Donna, like I did to Karen. Um, I, I have to say, when I've gone in to talk to you, it's kind of like going to school. I always get new information and it's a lot less scary than going to some of my classes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. It's been, um, it's been a learning experience for sure. Um, Donna, how many years? 14? Um, 13 for almost 14 with the town and um, almost 10 as the land use administrator. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Donna, great Donna, thank you. I would like to have worked uh, longer with you, but um, thank you so much. Well, we still have until September and you don't have a CEO for your house yet. So <laughs> <laughs> working on it. <laughs> Dang. We'll see you soon. Yes, we will. <laughs> In a week. <laughs> And with that, I am going to unspotlight <laughs> the group. And All right, we thanks will... for your time. I'm out. We're Thank gonna... you, everybody. Thanks, Matt. Matt.
Yep. Thanks, Wes. Thanks, Lynn. Thank you. Um, Thank you for coming just... in, folks. Okay. Go ahead, Donna. You were going to say something. Um, yeah, I just would like to, um, again, reiterate what Darlene has said. You know, I mean, um, whether people realize it or not, we were considered essential employees. We worked through the pandemic. We were there every day. Our offices, if they weren't open to the general public, we still did business. I processed more permits in the past two years than I have um, going back at least four or five um, with, with one less person. Um, and, and I can say that our departments that are in town hall have done exactly the same thing. Um, one of the things that Lamont had said, um, and it was, well, I'm quoting this from, taking this from the newspaper, we need to pay our people who actually came to work over the past two years, did their jobs and did their jobs at the best of their ability with what they were working with. So I echo what Darlene says, I really ask you guys to please look at, at where you're gonna be spending your money. And don't use the salary line, as Darlene has said, as a throwaway or a, okay, we bumped this up, we need to borrow a little bit from here or there. I think we as professionals who run and work in the town hall and when our departments deserve more than that. Thank you. Thanks, Donna. Thank you. Thanks, Donna. Just um, a quick, let me unspotlight you. Ooh, the deck chairs are just moving around. <laughs> um, can the, there's somebody who's on a cell phone. Um, it would be great if we could, if the, Last four digits are 0507. If we could read. Yeah, that's that my. That's, yeah, oh, that's, that's you, me. Lynn. That's your phone, your audio, Lynn. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I, listen, I'm, are you also dealing tonight with your nonprofit line items or not? Um, the We have on the docket um, the library, emergency management, and Kent Volunteer Fire Department. And that's um, who we have for tonight. Okay, thank you. Then I won't hang around and clog up your. <laughs> That's okay. Thanks for coming, Lynn. Good night. All right, on deck, Sarah. I'm gonna put you. I'm gonna spotlight you. Um, oh, Jean, is this just, for the library? Yes. And I was gonna ask Sarah who else she'd like me to um, spotlight. I gotta find Sarah again in my list here. <laughs> Hi. Uh, the other person to spotlight, Sandy and John Walker. On it, um, Sandy. Hi, Sandy and John. I'm going to introduce Sandy and John, and then because of my uh, little conflict here with the selectmen, uh, I will let Sandy do most of the talking tonight. So John, you're still muted. Um, I'm here with uh, the president of the Kent Library Association, Sandy Edelman, and the treasurer of Kent Library Association, John Walker. Hello. And uh, hello. And we are asking for the same amount as last year. We're not asking for an increase. Um, Sandy can speak a little more specifically to that. Um, but as I said, it's, it's a flat request. Sandy and or John, by all okay. means. Okay, yes, I'm gonna take your, the lead. Your time. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Sarah. Yes, uh, I'm the president of the Kent Library Association. Many of you know that for about four years, I was co-president with Tim Blackheader, who often took a back seat in this presentation because of being on the Board of Finance, but um, he's now just an ordinary board member for which we are grateful. And I've taken over as sole president uh, during uh, 2021. And I'm here with um, John Walker, who's our treasurer. Uh, and I'm grateful he can often answer questions about our financial uh, data sheets uh, if that comes up. So, um, and as Sarah mentioned, um, I'm gonna take the lead. And uh, sometimes there may be questions I'll ask her, but let's see if I can handle them without her. So yes, uh, top of the line, we're requesting $125,000, as Sarah said, the same amount we requested last year. Um, and we're grateful for what we've always received, but you know, we do sometimes say we're not a town. I don't have to tell you guys, you guys know most many people in our town do not, we're not a town 
library. We're not a municipal department. Um, we do get a nice amount of money from the town. Um, it could be around 29 and 30 percent, but we are raising um, 70 percent of our funds, which is not always easy, but we work very hard to do it um, with an army of volunteers. Um, uh, as some of you know, we're working, and I kind of wanted to make sure this was clear, we're working on a possible expansion of our facilities into the old firehouse building. Um, we are exploring that. Um, no money from operating funds or from the town grant is being used to explore that. We are privately fundraising at this point. We've gotten some, we're grateful for some early donations that have allowed us to do the groundwork, hire an architect, look at a design, but we don't know. We don't know if we're going to be able to succeed in that. We don't know when it would take, how long it would take, how much money it's going to cost. We don't know any of that. So I, I don't want anybody thinking um, that's definitely going to happen and we don't need this money. We definitely need the money from the town um, in the interim, although we do hope, we really do hope that we're going to do something with that main street location that will benefit not only the library, it will benefit the town patrons, visitors, tourists, businesses. I think it's a Main Street location. We know about it right now. We're making use of it for the book sale, which is popular and has its own volunteer community, but more could be done with it. And I think the town would really benefit from it. So I, I just wanted to get that out. Um, so um, we didn't ask for a raise, but you know, I heard other people, I'm glad I was on at least tonight. Yes, there are rising costs and some of that's for employees. And we hired a couple of children's librarians in the last year. We are now hiring for a uh, circulation assistant uh, due to an upcoming retirement of Mary Ellen, maybe uh, Sarah, that's not a secret because I just let it out of the bag, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, but don't, don't make a big deal out of it, anybody. Yeah, She'll she get very upset. She doesn't want to party or anything. Um, anyway, and many of you know, I should have led with this. It's our hundredth anniversary this month. We're so excited. Um, we're going to turn hundred on March, March 25th, 26th. And um, we are going to be holding an open house party for families and children in the afternoon on the tw Saturday, the 26th. We are going to hold a more adult party um, uh, late afternoon. We hope everybody in town government and the town will attend and help us celebrate. Um, it's just a great time with us coming out of the pandemic uh, with maybe exciting new plans. So, but back to costs. Yes, every time we have to, re to replace an employee, uh, it costs. And we, you know, we try to keep salaries low. Uh, Sarah is our only full-time employee. Everybody else is part-time, but we have to, you know, we have to pay something. I mean, sometimes we'll place a job and like only two people will apply <laughs> and we don't have that much choice to get the skills we want. So uh, that and, and supplies and other things that have gone up in expense. Um, so, but notwithstanding that, we're keeping our request uh, static. So, um, we feel like we work hard to deserve the town support, that we bind the community together. We're a building on Main Street that everybody can share in, whether it's quiz night, whether it's an art exhibit. You know, they, the children's programs, you know, help out during the summer with library camp, during school breaks, with teacher training days, no matter what it is. When school isn't on, the library's counter programming yes. to make sure the parents have kids, have places to go that are safe that are enjoyable and where they'll meet other children. Anyway, that's our pitch for what we do. We're very proud of it. Um, and we're happy to answer questions. Thanks so much. And and truly everybody knows, but it's worth saying again, how you all have just continued to hit it out of the park during the pandemic. I mean, you were came up with new programs and were, were always there for families and for kids. It, it was, Really great. Hat off. <laughs> it was our pleasure. I, I just, just real quickly to add something. Um, I'm a, I'm a relative newcomer to the town and and relatively new to the library board. And I must say that having worked on a um, a number of uh, not for profit organizations over the years, I just find this organization so vibrant. Um, there is always something happening. There's always somebody that you know. Sarah is always coming up with new ideas. Um, the financials, uh, notwithstanding, we are quite honestly, I think one of the most well-respected and financially viable libraries in the state of Connecticut. And, um, I think we do a tremendous job and I'm very proud to be part of this organization. 
Great. Thanks, John. Len or Rufus, do you all have questions? I do not. I have uh, I have no questions. I, I just will tell you that when I was on the Board of Finance and my wife at the time was a part time worker at the library, I was asked to recuse myself and I refused. Uh, I figured out that the uh, approximate raise would have been about eighty two dollars. <laughs> And I said, I'll, I'll write a check out for twice that amount to the library right now. I'm not, I'm a total supporter of the library and always have been. So you guys are wonderful. Thank, Thank you. I have, I have one the, last question uh, for, for John. Um, what's the name of your partner in the background there? <laughs> that's uh his name is Kulane and he's a 20 year old horse that my son grew up with and is currently residing across the backyard at uh, Brook Run Stables so y'all will have to keep this under your hats I have no pictures of my children in my office but I do have a picture of um, what is somewhat of a, a partner to your uh, <laughs> <laughs> I saw the the, the white white uh fur and the ears and it sparked my uh, of memory life. of my fella <laughs> part of our lives and part of our family you know yes absolutely well sandy john sarah thanks so much for coming with your thank pitch. you I think and we have any other questions. questions that come up you know where to find us okay absolutely yes, i do, I do okay. in fact yeah ha, ha. Well, thank you that certificate of occupancy glennon <laughs> right <laughs> Can't no, wait don't to look the we're, house. we're occupying we're occupying Shh. i'm gonna say sarah you should blur your background i know right <laughs> okay thank you thanks, thanks. i'm much. gonna shuffle the deck chairs again and next up is eric with emergency management if you'll give me one second to do a little bit of shuffling sarah 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 the pains move around very fast when people leave. Righty. Thanks, Eric, for joining. Hey, all. And the floor is yours. Um, thank you. Um, so uh, we submitted this to uh, Barbara in kind of a twofold. Um, basically, the budget for the year which uh, includes the stipends, the supplies, the contract for VOC, which is the uh, software program that we use to track all our incidents. Um, Everbridge, which is the emergency notification system that the town has enrolled in. Um, mileage, the telephone system, uh, the, the cost of the telephone system for the um, phone that, that uh, is, is run by emergency management. Um, but we also um, put in for a ring central system. Obviously the, obvious, the office is not manned on a regular basis. So this would allow the um, phone calls to go to a, um, you know, you can do a lot, of, um, a lot of stuff with that ring central. You can send it to email, you can send it to voicemail, you can, uh, um, apparently um, access it remotely. Um, cell phone reimbursement, radio maintenance, uh, dues, training, um, equipment for the CERT team, and then deployment expenses. So that total uh, 37185 And then um, we have a separate box that includes the capital improvements to, to get basically the office um, up to par, which includes the uh, updated LEOP, which we've had several discussions on, the pandemic insert, office upgrades, computer purchase, uh, the status monitors, and then writing the COOP and cyber plan. Um, that's an additional 35600 I see that um, it is all in the same line for uh, this year. What can I answer?
Um, Eric, can you go back to the first line, the stipends, and explain sure. how those lay out? Well, um, it's uh, laid out as uh, $10,000 for the director and $5,000 for the deputy. Okay. And then um, going down to the coop plan and the cyber plan, mm -hmm. um, are those outside fees? Are you hiring somebody to do those? Um, we could. Um, or, you know, what was the, the plan of it? Yeah, I mean, for you, guys? you know, we've, we've talked about hiring somebody for the LEOP, the coop plan, the cyber plan. Uh, obviously, I think you know what happened with that when we reached out. Uh, these these consultants were so busy that they they wouldn't even talk to us, or um, uh, they basically told us to uh, come back at a later date. So, um, I, I mean, at this point, these would be handled by the uh, by the staff. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about um, the deployment expenses and the cert equipment lines? Sure. So. Um, uh, just looking back at the previous years, you know, we, we, the CERT team obviously gets deployed for a whole host of, um, of, uh, jobs. Most, mostly, you know, they were, they were dealing with the distribution of test kits and masks. And for a long time, they were at the test site, uh, the past uh, year. Um, so it's for, the equipment would be for, uh, you know, uh, we bought vests, we bought jackets, we bought flashlights, we bought radio equipment. Um, so that, that type of equipment. And then the deployment expenses obviously would be subject to if they're deployed or not. And uh, basically um, feeding them and, uh, you know, coffee and things like that. So if they're out on a long deployment, then um, we have some expense money to uh, to take care of them. And then radio maintenance is there's a radio maintenance came right from the last um, spreadsheet, the uh, last uh, profit cheap. and loss that showed. Uh, oh. 2590 in um, town hall radios and external speakers. So I, I assume there was something that went wrong with the radio with, at the town hall that got yeah. put into the emergency management line. Yes. There was some, is Rick on the call? Yeah, Rick, there was a, I can't remember what the issue was. Uh, it was, uh, I think, the original radio from when Danny was there, I believe, or it was just, oh, so, so it just the one scan anymore wouldn't go right to where it was supposed to go. So that's right. That's like a base radio, Eric. Correct. Are you guys going to be tied into? How's that going to work in the firehouse? Are you tied into? You have a separate system? Uh, there would be, yes. I believe there's uh, um, a separate radio that would go in the the um, office. Okay. And cell phone reimbursement? That's like you guys use your own personal cell phones or what? Basically all we've used for the past two years. Yeah. Yep. And there's a number. Joyce, do you know how many um, employees have get cell phone reimbursement is it it's either five or six currently have um get reimbursed i think it's fifty dollars a month for their cell phones and the, i don't know where that it's in the department um the department um budgets i don't there's not a separate line for them but it's incorporated within their budgets from what i recall is that correct, Joyce? Do you mean in the fire department? No. Oh, no. Like employees in town hall. 
Okay. Our Either individual fine. budget is telephone and the and then the telephone line and the town and the selectman's office covers all the normal billings. Ah, so maybe the telephone should come out of this budget, but yeah, I don't I don't yeah, so I think the telephone line and the ring central line would need to go over into the phone category, the catch all phone category. Um, and I think also the, the computer stuff, the computer equipment would go there as well. So can I just make one comment about the supplies line? Um, I was, I was going to ask that next. Yeah, that, that may be obviously, uh, a little extreme. I, I, I base that off of, um, some of the supplies that were ordered during the pandemic that totaled almost $4,000 for uh, hand sanitizer, office supplies, disinfectants, Tyvek uh, boots, um, goggles and spray bottles. It was all in this, um, came out of this line. So, uh, you know, obviously, uh, hopefully we, we never have something like this where we need all that that uh, sanitizer again, but um, that that's where that came from. So maybe maybe that can be uh, reduced. Yeah. So I yeah, that probably was an anomaly. My guess is that that could be significantly reduced to cover, you know, like office supplies and things like that. Civil preparedness. Last year, the budget was four thousand nine fifty. Correct. And and I've gone back in time. I've looked at all the other budgets, and um, you know, through time, and it's been about the same, maybe less. Um, and uh, and Gene, you've said in the past that uh, FEMA used to give us some money for civil preparedness a while ago. So post nine eleven, there were there was just tons and tons of money coming from the federal government. Um, and then that money dried up in, oh, Eric, 05, 09, something like that. So the towns by and large were not really even thinking about funding emergency management because the money was coming from the federal government in that post 9-11 era. How much a year came to us? I have no okay. idea. A ten thousand, twenty thousand, tons. I've, we bought a yeah. gator with it. We bought. Uh, I mean, they, they, well, like, but I, I need a number. I mean, <laughs> I, just I don't need, know the like, like ten thousand, twenty thousand. I just uh, no how idea. much money? Yeah, I'd like I'd no like to idea. know what that was. Um, but but you say that that dried up in in oh 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 nine oh eight. Um. Yeah. I I don't quote me on that, but okay. there was a point where those dollars started to to really dry up. Okay. So, you know, I mean, going, going back through time, I mean, uh, you know, um, civil preparedness had 2,000, 3,000, 4,000. Um, now it's 4,950. Uh, to me, this is a, a rather large jump uh, to 72,000. I mean, am, am I looking at these numbers correctly here? That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a big jump percentage wise in this budget this year. Sure is. Okay. Has, has this ever come up before? Um, you know, last year, the year before, like this kind of a jump? Absolutely. Okay. We went through this with the last board of selectmen. They were, you know, uh, had a, a difficult time with it. They wanted uh, presentations and, and what we do. We did all that. Um, in my opinion, they were, they were good with it and ready to fund it. And then the election happened. And then we did it all over again for you guys. So um, we just seem to continually do this. And uh, I, listen, I, I, uh, I, I, I will echo um, um, Darlene and Donna, you know, uh, this, this 
uh, office has never been, has always been a volunteer organization, but um, it's not that anymore. It's a, uh, you know, we, we, we all work full-time jobs too, but uh, at the drop of a hat, when something happens, we are on it. We're on the phone with uh, what, wh whoever the partners are, whether it's the, the state, the region, our Eversource partners, uh, you know, we're, we're making things happen. And, and it's, you know, one of the concerns was it was, uh, we don't see what you do. Correct. We're, we're doing it behind the scenes and, and uh, getting it done. So um, it, it really is no longer a uh, volunteer position. Um, and, uh, the, you know, $15,000 of that 72,000 is the, the stipends. Again, the, the, you know, the, the other, equipment. I'm sorry, the other uh, big number is the, uh, the, the OC, which is our, our platform for uh, logging incidents. It's about a $7,000 a year um, contract, which doesn't even, isn't even covered by the, by the budget. Now, I don't know if that moved to, uh, computer expenses, uh, you know, in, in town hall, but uh, it's currently in this budget. Correct. And again, the, you know, things that are gonna get added to the, you know, the list of things that you all are doing is managing the Everbridge database. Once that's truly up and running and, done with the testing, that's going to be emergency management to um, manage a, you know, a database that has every resident's um, phone number, email address, all of their contact pathways to send out emergency messages directly to the residents, and that's going to all be their responsibility as well. Can, can I just say one, just, one other thing? Yeah, uh, Glenn, you said it's seventy two thousand dollars. That that is correct, but I think you got to break it down into two: the actual budget and then the the what I'm calling capital improvements. I don't I don't know if that's the right term in this in this instance. So so the budget is really thirty seven thousand uh, dollars. Seven thousand of that is that VOC. Uh, Twenty uh, forty five hundred of that is the uh, cert team, which we've never had before up until a year ago or a year and a half ago. Um, so uh, I, I know it's a big number, but um, I feel the, the, uh, the office has been put to the test this past couple of years and uh, we were, we got through it, but we were behind uh, the eight ball. No, I, have no, I have no doubt, I have no yeah. doubt. Um, when uh, when you were on here uh, uh, before one of the meetings uh, a while ago, um, we were still talking about what what office you were going to be in or what space. I mean, has that all been ironed out? I mean, you have a you have a spot in um, the firehouse now. Is that we do. We we requested it from the fire department. They granted it. Um, we haven't set it up yet because we we really don't have the funding to to really set it up. Um, but um, yes, we do have a space. There was, there was, uh, I don't think you had expended all the funds for this year. I mean, not much, not. But, you know, for, um, do you have at least a computer in there? Like, I mean, do you have, um, I mean, do you have, we, we do not yet, but we're, we're, um, working with the computer vendor to get that handled. Okay. Cause that's that, you know, that, that, that's my first, uh, you know, concern, like just immediately, sure. like, like, let's get you set up. You have some funds in your budget currently and, yep. uh, let's, let's get you up and running. At the very least, you know. Okay. Yes. Thanks, Eric. All righty. Thank Rufus, you. Anything thank you, Eric. further? Gene, could I comment on the emergency management? Um, I, I, I've been really trying to just focus on the discussion um, with the, you know, with the players that are coming to present their budgets. Um, okay. But I'll, you. you know what, because it's, you're 
closely related to emergency, you know, you are emergency response. So you're uh, obviously um, very tethered with emergency management. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a minute. I just wanted to um, say to the selectmen that times have changed um, and what is required or, or wanted to do from the state, what is required and wanted from uh, Eversource, uh, you know, something like that um, is, is changing. It's changed for us from the fire department. Our, and that's where I'm speaking specifically, you know, that from the fire department side, not speaking as, as you know, as Alan Gobble, just as a point of information or to clarify for you, but how we handle calling the power company or notification, how things are done, it's changed. There's other things. It's a learning experience for us at the fire station and at the as firefighters. Um, and there is things that are just being done and asked to be done differently. So there's a, um, a, a need for involvement that really wasn't there um, even, you know, not that long ago. I'm not gonna talk about budgets or numbers, you know, that that's all you guys. Uh, but I just wanted you to know that there it is changed and there is a lot more work um, that's involved and that comes out uh, from this area that wasn't done um, in the past or Thanks required so. or asked. So thank you. So I'm going to shuffle the deck chairs one more time. And John Russell is on. Um, John, do you have, who would you like um, spotlighted with you? Yeah, well, I think, um, why, don't, why don't we have Alan be uh, M MC for the fire department and he'll turn it over to, to Bonnie with her presentation. Okay. Um, one second. There we go. And, and Bonnie as well, did you say? Yeah, yes. she'll, she'll have the numbers. Okay, great. Thank you, thank you. And the floor is yours. And if you need a screen share, I think it's already set to multiple. Oh, it is now thank though. Thank you. That, that'll be Bonnie doing the screen share, definitely not me. <laughs> um, so we have you know, two areas um, to discuss with uh, the three of you as we discussed briefly before. One is the operational grant that goes into funding for the operational part of the department. Um, and then the other is the uh, medical staff, medical staff. Um, which is separate and handled separate in the uh, the town budget and handled uh, as a, a line item as uh, a, a reimbursement of expenses um, that the fire department spends, uh, you know, on that. So that money stays in the town budget. And then when we submit a uh, uh, an invoice that we've paid, uh, you reimburse the the fire department, you know, for that amount of money. Um, the operational grant is different, whereas you give us a grant um, and we put that into our budget and uh, try, you know, use that as, as a, a revenue line in our budget to uh, function um, and provide the service for fire and ambulance, uh, you know, for the year. So on the, uh, the operational uh, side of things, the operational grant, uh, we have um, presented to you um, a, a to hold the line flat um, for this coming fiscal year, um, the same money as the previous year. Um, our budget does uh, originally with, with doing that um, had approximately a $50,000 deficit. Um, so to make up that difference, um, we are moving monies from um, previous years uh, where money was saved um, in order to do that. So for example, more donations came in, let's say in a year in the past, that money saved, it's not just because money comes in, we don't just you know, spend it. Um, so we're taking money from that and putting it into the, uh, the tune of about $50,000. Some of that's from ambulance billing revenue um, over the previous years, uh, a little bit from donations over the previous years. And um, also uh, we now um, are having revenue come in that's in a, a over the past couple of years in a very positive way for the rental um, of the building um, that's out behind the firehouse. So, you know, the one that was existing there for a long time. The goal as, as people that would remember uh, going back uh, years when that was done and put was that eventually we'd be able to create some revenue from that. So there is revenue coming um, in. And so that is also um, going into the, 
the budget this year to offset that. Um, so no increase requested in that area, but I wanted you to be aware that um, obviously as these monies are from savings are brought over, um, that can't happen all you know, in the years that are going forward and, and so forth. So expenses are up overall as you're hearing and dealing with uh, and so forth. And then overall the um, revenue is down um, for, you know, our, our things that we do. Um, specifically uh, our general contributions this past year that we just finished up um, was down about $4,000 just as a, a point of information. Um, and then the um, ambulance billing uh, and you'll see in a minute when buying is over the calls, you're going to see that our call volume has gone up, but the amount of money that we collect from billing um, went down um, from the previous year. So uh, I don't know if you have any questions on that um, on the regular budget, but the, the biggest point now that we want to need to get into, uh, obviously, is the uh, uh, paid staffing uh, for the uh, ambulance. No? Okay. Um, so on the paid staffing, I'm going to turn this part over right now to uh, Bonnie. She is going to screen share. Um, when we had talked, remember before, uh, we talked to you about a um, uh, the work that a committee did from a couple years ago. And um, so they had put together a brief um, PowerPoint presentation. Um, this is a, a, a modification to that uh, because this is when we first were explaining how we had to go to paid staffing, the reasons why and stuff behind it. So there's a few highlights in here. Um, I know that Rufus and um, Glenn, you guys were not on the, the board of selectmen at, at that time, uh, but um, so we can certainly go into more detail, you know, when you need it or any other, any follow-up questions, but we didn't want to take all your time with some of the history that was done and wanted to just give a summary and um, focus on a few things. Um, so I'll turn it over to Bonnie now and she'll touch base on that. Um, I do want to make a point that we have uh, started and appointed a new uh, staffing committee, even though the one just finished up its work two years ago, um, to look at, again, uh, any uh, other options that we have, um, everything from seeing about regionalization, um, which we looked at briefly before, but to look at is, is this uh, using a, a contracted staffing service the way to go versus you know hiring um, our own people versus um, the the best goal would be what can we do to um, encourage growth in volunteerism um, so that way that you know the, the calls can be covered that way Bonnie let me just bring my screen up All right, can you guys all see that? Yes. Okay. So this is the um, new committee that was just formed to look into um, options for staffing. Um, myself, Jill Scholson, who's my assistant ambulance chief, um, Alex Limbos, Dan Kabaskalian, and Marianne Van Valkenburg gonna be on this committee. Uh, this is a timeline um, going back to 2013, uh, the number of calls. And as you can see, 2013, 14, 15, um, the calls were five over 600 calls. And that was when the Kent was open. Um, a lot of our calls were to the Kent. They closed the end of 15, I think the beginning of 16. And so our numbers dropped in 16, 17, 18, and 19. And then in 2020, big drop, um, almost uh, down 100 calls. And that was due to COVID. Um, a lot of comments from patients were they didn't want to go to the hospital because that was where you would catch COVID. So our calls dropped significantly that year. And last year, they started to come back up. Um, but what Alan was saying, even though the numbers are coming back up, um, the revenue is not. And that's because even though haul volume is up, transport numbers are also, or non-transports are going up. 
So we're being called to places, but we're not transporting and we don't bill if we don't transport. So numbers are coming up, but revenue is not. Um, I, like I just said, the largest call volume was when the Kent was in operation. And one of our main concerns, and this was a concern uh, a couple of years ago when we came in looking to do paid staff was that we're, we're afraid the call volume is going to increase again once the expansion at High Watch is complete, which um, I believe is very soon. Um, Alan, was it March, April they were talking about opening? Um, and then, um, you know, when Birch Hill goes in, um, that could be a significant increase in call volume for us. Um, our scheduling, um, some of the contributing factors to the current decline in volunteer staffing is there's just less volunteers out there. Um, there's a larger time commitment, health, um, injury constraints. Uh, when I was putting this together, I took some numbers and 66% of our active EMS responders are over the age of 50. So how long can we keep it up at the, at the rate we're going? And then of course, COVID was another big factor. Um, the way our schedule is set up, um, we're set up with six hour increments. Um, midnight to 6 a.m., 6 a.m. to noon, noon to 6 p.m., 6 p.m. to midnight. Um, you need two uh, EMS, two, two staff members for a legal crew. So it's time for some math here. Um, there's eight shifts in a day. That works out to 56 shifts in a week, which is 2,920 shifts in a year, okay. Um, as of today, March 2nd, <laughs> there are 19 unassigned shifts. That's the shifts that we need to pay the paid staff for that's not covered by volunteers. So out of the 56, 37 shifts are covered by volunteers. And that's 66% of the total shifts are covered by volunteers. And there's only nine of us. There are only nine volunteers that um, go on calls. So as you can see, it's pretty, it's pretty slim. So when we were asked to come up with uh, a number, a budget number, we took the worst case scenario, which means paying somebody to cover those 2,900 and whatever shifts um, a year. And this is how we figured it out, if you can follow here. 56 shifts a week at six hours per shift is 336 hours per week. Multiply that by 31.25 an hour, which is what we have to pay the staffing company. And that comes out to about $10,500 a week. And you multiply that by 52 weeks in a year and you're at $546,000. And that's to have coverage 24 seven, 365 days a year. And what we did was we subtracted the stipend allowance from the KVFD budget for volunteers. And that brought the total request um, down to $492,000. And that's how we came up with that. And then the current staffing model that we're working on right now um, did 23 shifts per week, six hours each, 138 hours a week, um, multiplied by the 3125 is $4,312.50 a week times 52 weeks uh, is 224,250. 
So that's the grand total on our current staffing model, um, basically what we're working on right now. So that's what I have. Any questions? So Bonnie, that 224, 250 is if nothing changed, if no EMTs or EMRs were injured, we didn't know exactly right. how it is now. Nobody retired, nobody nobody um, got hurt on the lottery. Sick. Right. <laughs> right. Okay. If that's if the trend continues the way it's going right now. And do you have indicators from the nine that and that they're gonna have life changes or um, you know any sort of predictors for the next um, you know sixteen months? I mean, it's it's hard to predict what's going to happen tomorrow. Right. Um, I mean, this time last year we thought we were we're doing great, you know, we were going to come in under budget. And, and then we had one member go down um, with a medical issue and we've lost and, and they were one of the top responders. Um, so, I, I mean, it's impossible for me to say, I don't have a crystal ball. Um, the only thing I can say is our responders, like I said, you know, close to 70% are over the age of 50. So, you know. Just to add, a, to, add to that comment um, or your question, Jean, is in this model, this current staffing model, we used, <clears throat> if you can see by the math, a number of 33 shifts covered by KVFD. Um, whereas currently um, we have 37 being covered by KVFD. Um, so we dropped it a little bit. Um, part of that dropping was um, because we don't know what may happen. So trying to add a little safety buffer in there. But on top of that, we do know that, um, as you said, looking ahead, trying to forecast that one of our um, active members uh, goes to a, a work assignment um, for I think it's between six and eight weeks during the course of the year. So they come off for those six to eight weeks. So we're, we're using our best with the data that we have and information we have, um, we're using our best um, judgment in making that those predictions. Thanks. But when, some, when something happens like a medical or, you know, when uh, a, a job change, a career change, a life change, you know, to somebody um, or, very high call volume, um, it, it gets uh, gets difficult. Um, one of the other things that we're me meaning for people to keep up with the same amount of, of setups. When when uh, Bonnie referenced uh, time commitments, longer time commitments, um, and and I I know Rufus because you've you know done this and and were ambulance chief and in the past you know that used to have a fairly overall a fairly fast turnaround time. It was still longer than most ambulance services around because of where Kent's located in proximity to the hospitals. But now um, the majority of, of anything significant, if not all things significant, does not go to New Melford. It goes all the way to Danbury. Um, and the last two calls that I did uh, were Danbury transports um, just this past uh, week. Uh, the, the other side of that was Sharon but um, as you all, I'm sure, have been reading and seeing, um, Sharon is, I don't know what's going to happen up there. I mean, we had to divert a while ago or not too long ago calls because of, pro of they didn't have um, mechanical things to do, you know, this, the uh, um, diagnostics that was needed. And then also they, um, they still were accepting patients at the ER, but the ICU was closed for um, multiple days. Um, so we were informed. So we had patients, you know, that needed ICU things and so forth. Again, for us, that was where it was an advantage to us or to the Kent residents because mm -hmm. we have an option that's, you know, somewhat reasonable for timeline, um, you know, with New Melford. And then if it's anything more serious, it's going right down to, uh, you know, to Danbury. Right. And so that that's one of those, you know, I've been, we've been hearing about Sharon Hospital, right? Their plan is to 
shutter their labor and delivery. And so there are these, un, it's this ripple effect that, that goes all the way out to, to this, right? So you think, oh, well, okay, can't have a baby at Sharon Hospital anymore. Can't have a baby in a Milford Hospital either. So if right. you find yourself in labor and you waited too long, there's now more pressure put on the EMS systems all over the Northwest corner because they, the, those two hospitals as you know, smaller shuttering more services hospitals are forcing EMS to increase the amount of the, the likelihood that they're going to have to deliver a baby in the back of the ambulance, which is the last place you want to deliver a baby. And Alan and I were on call the other night and it was, we went out at one pretty much right on the dot. 430, 415, 430. 430. we got back from one call um, because we had to take our patient to Danbury. So the there are massive unintended consequences that are affecting all sorts of pieces and parts of our communities by these hospitals, um, you know, backing off the really truly core services um, that they've been providing. So it's, the ripple effect is really, really concerning to me. And so I, I don't know, um, you know, just to give you a little bit of background, uh, how we, like these numbers we've given you, but <clears throat> how we come up with those. So I, that's why we wanted to put it in this format so you could see about how the shifts are done, how we break that out. Um, how, you know, we try between the nine of us right now to, and there were more than that when this, you know, when we came to the town uh, a year and a half ago, um, but we're currently at nine. Um, they range anywhere from one person does one shift a week, you know, in this schedule. Um, the majority of our people do two shifts a week out of the nine. And um, some of us are in the middle, you know, like myself and, you um, then we have a, a high-end person that uh, you know signs up or, or regularly does nine uh, shifts per week, you know, out of that setup. Their life um, allows them to do that, um, you know, is uh, currently. So um, the the a goal, dream, you know, I mean, whatever you want to call it, but our, our, as we're moving forward, is to see if more people, because then you spread, you know, things out. You can spread it out. You can have more volunteers. You can have not so many shifts to have to be covered. We obviously then could work on, you know, where we have the, the holes and, and so forth, um, you know, where the numbers are, um, everything from, from 23, uh, you know, shifts to be paid or, or less than that to 19, uh, you know, where it is. Um, the, a company, what, what we chose for the model after the research or the first committee did that went through it um, was that there are two staffing companies, just as a point of information, um, in that are licensed and authorized in the state of Connecticut to provide um, EMTs to a service. Um, so there are many, many, many services around um, the state that do this, use a staffing company. They use that model. We didn't invent this model. Um, so then what we do is we negotiate with, we negotiated with both companies um, and um, we reviewed the contracts and so forth. And then um, get a, an hourly rate. Um, the hourly rate is tiered um, for when you schedule ahead, just so you're, you're aware um, versus a, a short notice versus an emergency notice. Um, we try, the, the nine of us very, very, very strongly and I think do very well that when we have an emergency coverage um, that we don't use the staffing agency, we uh, cancel something that one of us has planned or, or was committed to, so we can go ahead and cover that shift for um, the other responder. Um, so that way the department doesn't, or the town doesn't get the um, emergency cost associated with emergency coverage, um, if it can be covered uh, by that. So what we've just started, Bonnie and I, um, as chiefs of the department, um, we just started to um, review the, the contract, just meaning with it a few months ago um, with our current company and uh, do a year-end you know, report or, or overview with them. And then also looked again um, at the existing companies. We're starting to put numbers together, excuse me, the other company that's uh, authorized in the state, um, the new company. Um, the problem we have right now um, is they were very upfront that they would not even consider a contract with us 
because we don't provide uh, sleeping quarters. We don't currently have that in the firehouse. It's not set up for that. Um, so that's where we are with that, with the two companies. You know, when you talk about competition or rates or, you know, all those things, um, well, where does this dollar amount come from or something like that? So um, this requires or, or has that company, they pay everything. It's a contract for staffing. So they pay the workers comp on the employee. They pay the, uh, the, the, the federal taxes, state taxes, you know, um, liability insurance. They, they do all that. We pay a fat, flat rate uh, per hour uh, on work. If I, if I could just jump in and I'd say that the current company we're using um, has been working great with us uh, and they're sending us great talent. Um, and uh, even the, the, the in, in-house relationship is, is great. Uh, and then, but another perspective just to share is that our current EMS volunteers, I would just to clarify the picture, because um, we we have been over this discussion many times with with one another in the in the in the EMS group. Um, so it's safe to say that the EMS responders in the department are really kind of at the max number of shifts that their life allows at this time. While at the same time, I'd, I'd say they're probably. Uh, of course, I'm generalizing, but I'm probably pretty on. Is that they're they're content, they're happy with the number of the sh shifts that they're doing, um, but to do more shifts, uh, you're kind of entering that that potential burnout zone. And I'm appreciative of the fact that they aren't um, doing that. Um, but again, as Alan was saying, any one of them could have a a life changing event. Um, either a job change or a health uh, change. Uh, on the other hand, we do have two, two um, members currently taking an EMT course, uh, but one of them has, has had a life uh, event come up that could potentially um, take them um, or prevent them from being come, becoming a regular responder. And the, the other individual uh, may take one shift or, or two shifts. We don't know, uh, but it's, it's nice to know that's coming. And this is all part of the, the larger picture that Bonnie and Alan took into account as they kind of came up with these revised numbers for you tonight. Bear in mind that the, the really large number that we presented last time, the, the 490 number really does kind of um, it assures you essentially that we would not need to uh, even consider a, an issue with, with having to call a, a town meeting to supplement any under budget um, scenario where, where if in this case, with the numbers we're presenting to you tonight, if we had a number of life-changing scenarios for our current responders, we could go over this budget and would need to return to you um, to report that we're, we're not gonna be able to stay within the, the budget. And that, that I understand may trigger the need for a, a town meeting. I think that's all I wanted to add in. Thanks, John. I didn't know if Glenn or Rufus, if you had any questions about, you know, we we referenced stipends in here. Um, we referenced that in the budget for reimbursement. Um, being that you're new to the Board of Selectmen, um, I didn't know if you had any specific questions on that. I, and I see that the um, the emergency management had uh, referenced stipends in their setup. So I just wanted to be able to answer any questions if you had any on how we run that process or what's done there. Yeah, that um, I did. I have questions about how you deal with your stipends. That was not an issue back when I was involved. Um, I also wanted to know um, what the deal is like with High Watch. Um, 
you know, do we get an annual contribution from High Watch? Uh, my understanding was they gave the town an initial contribution, but that is, I don't know whether that's an annual contribution to help defray costs of ambulance services. Um, let me uh, start with the, the stipend. And um, as that was first, how we, we do the stipend program is um, it's done for people that sign up for uh, one of the shifts. So again, the shift is six hours. And as a uh, little bit of, of compensation for them committing to uh, be in town, not leave town, be able to uh, take duty for any call that happens. Um, it's a $25 stipend um, that is done, not per hour, not uh, you know anything else. It's $25 flat rate um, that is given. Um, the, the idea of the incentive started with um, gas cards um, when it originally uh, was started, and then it switched to uh, a dollar amount to help with people being able to be compensated slightly for the amount of shifts and be able to, to do that. So in uh, short, it's $25 per six hour shift versus you can see it's 3125 is what we're budgeting as a number per hour um, on a paid um, you know, person. So that's how the, the stipend uh, program works. Um, okay. It's currently set up that it's uh, done as they're not, we're not employees, you know, so it's a, independent contractor set up for or 1099 at the um, at the end and um, I would just say that it there uh, my understanding is that there is a proposed bill in the Connecticut legislature right now um, to make that the stipend programs throughout the state of Connecticut um, tax exempt. Yeah. yeah so again that is a huge plus and maybe would be a because I, I can tell you that that has been a, a part of a, of a problem or a concern, you know, in that, that case. So um, if you can get behind that, that may have a trickle down effect clearly. It clearly will help the nine of us, I'll be very upfront, but it may have a trickle down effect on, um, you know, other people also being able to, to do that. So just as a point of information as selectmen as you're out there with our local legislators. Um, also, um, uh, maybe before you answer the other question is, um, so there are two people in EMT class right now, but say over the last five years, how many new EMTs have you gotten? Bonnie, can you? Uh... Over the past five years? Yeah, I mean, are, are you getting one or two a year? Or are you uh, no. getting um... one or two for the last five years? <laughs> I think we had maybe one or two over the last five years. And age-wise, are they older than younger? We're not getting younger volunteers at all. Right, because um, there, <laughs> there's no money in it, you know? And I, I can use my own child, for example, who's mid-20s, and still has to live at home because they can't afford to move out. Um, and so volunteering and being a, a young person, they can't do it. So, right. for, so you convert that to that $25 stipend to an hour. $4.16 an hour. Right. <laughs> so, Rufus yeah, just not, also... Uh, with uh, to as a, a follow up on that, um, again going from memory now over the last few years, we have had a few uh, people that have joined. In other words, they saw the recruitment um, effort, <laughs> they saw signs, um, word of mouth. You know, all of that. I think word of mouth is definitely the best way. Um, but where they have um, decided to join, maybe going back maybe seven years, but some of them from Marblewood, um, they started courses, and then when they saw the commitment. Um, and also some younger, both men and women um, uh, that, that, you know, starting to join, they got into the classes and then had to stop or made it out of the class, but then just couldn't continue on 
um, with uh, what was involved. It's a big, big commitment. Oh, I know. Um, we, <laughs> and you know that, right? I mean, so much. So I'm just saying, you know, for and, and of recent, we had um, a, a local guy. He grew up here um, as a kid, lived here all his life, joined the department, started, became firefighter, became e EMR, um, started, and then had to move out of town for uh, find a place, better place to live. Um, so he's up in the Litchfield Torrington area where things are a little more affordable and uh, we'd love to have him back in the department, but uh, we have, you know, it's, it's just very, very tough. One of our captains um, has lived for several years in Sharon over the line because of, again, living, you know, so it's, it's, it's tough. I have a handful of uh, younger, when you're talking, you know, the age wise, where you hopefully pass this on, you know, into that case. Um, another one had to stop responding uh, as a regular basis because they had to move to Torrington. They're still in the department, um, but uh, they're very limited on what they can do to be here for us. Uh, another one, these are active members now, um, is in New Melford. Um, and these are people that live down there and, and you know, decided to join. We have a, a new, trying to get the juniors back in operation. One of the, the junior members is local right here, um, a, a third generation, you know, that's, that's just joining. We're excited about that. Um, and another one that's in the works um, lives in Gaylordsville, but is, you know, looking to join, uh, you know, Kent and so forth. Um, so, so there's some of it. The problem is then once it, it happens to see the time commitment, the cost, because when you go to class, you don't get mileage reimbursement. You we you we pay for the class, but there's you know all that time down, all that whatever, and and so forth. So, I thank you for bringing that up because it's a good a good point overall. The four or five or, or years you know or longer, what's been happening? That sort of oversex with uh, <laughs> the housing stock in town. Right, <laughs> it's like another one of those unintended consequences. Yeah. Part of that whole ripple effect. The it's but but big, you know basically you're not we're not attracting volunteers. Alan, how long have you had that stipend program? Is, is that a recent thing or is that? Um... We've had it about, uh, we went from gas cards to stipends for say the last six years. Six years. Okay. Um, I, I would be careful. This is so ambiguous to, to try and nail down reasons for this. There's just so many factors at play. I, I would be cautious about pinning it to finances alone uh, because if you ask the nine folks who are currently doing some shifts or no shifts and ask them, what what would you do if, if, if we eliminated the stipends? I, I would speculate they would continue doing shifts because we like it it's fun but i would also speculate we wouldn't do as many shifts um so i i'm not convinced that a stipend necessarily attracts new volunteers i think the most one of the most recent volunteers an associate emergency member i think she joined because she wants to help and I, I'm going to speculate that remains the most likely scenario in which someone would join the department, uh, either as a firefighter or an EMT, because they want to help. And I feel uh, like I, I, I agree with you, John. I don't think stipends are really what draws people. But it's, the question is why, you know, why is the shift? Um, you know, when I came to town in the 70s, there were a lot more younger people, people worked in town, people who were, you know, we, we had a very active, you know, more than nine. <laughs> I, I completely agree with your line of thinking there. This was a somewhat more agrarian town. People yeah. were more attached to the land. They were more local. There were more labor related jobs that have, were more flexible. Uh, and that that has changed. I, I'm kind of curious, though, because the demographics, I would suspect, are changing to uh, at home work uh, as well, online work. And I'm just I'm still kind of curious. Uh, is that an untapped volunteer market for us where folks who are making their livings online could could get up and 
uh, head out to a call and then come back. Well, it's somehow tapping in, into that and, and the idea that, that, you know, a lot of, a lot of people are working at home or I think relatively new also to town and, and, um, and they're not necessarily tied to the community yet. Hmm. I think a lot yeah, of it thanks. has to do with being tied to your community. And yeah, I think there's also an issue of um, with the pandemic, um, being in healthcare, and specifically, this is the front door to healthcare. And it, I talked to a lot of people, and I talked about you know, recruiting and, and getting people interested and excited about fire and EMS. And a lot of the feedback is, wow, getting in the back of an ambulance with somebody and they might have, they might have COVID. I'm, I'm not really willing to do that for my family. Um, so th I think there's that component. There is a very, very serious shortage of um, EMS providers at the EMT level and the paramedic level in the state. Um, and a, this is a national problem. Mm -hmm. And it's because the profession is really still in its infancy. It's only been around since the, you know, mid sixties proper. And there you look at nurses, nurses are finally getting paid what they should be getting paid. EMS providers are not even close. And so you have, you have, you know, people who are in their early 20s saying, do I want to go to paramedic school or do I want to go to nursing school? I'm going to go to nursing school and go make $80,000, $100,000 more, $150,000, $160,000 being a travel nurse, traveling around the country, go be a trauma nurse. They're going to go do that. They're, they're going to skip right over where we used to see folks coming up from, we have two members of our department, three members of our department who came up, they became EMTs, and then they became paramedics. And and they're doing their best and you know working a lot of hours to make a living wage as a paramedic you're you're seeing them bypassing the EMS system altogether and going and working for a big hospital system which is that's where healthcare is is in the big hospital systems and we we're seeing it in Connecticut so it's a big i think it's a big stew of um, of an uphill battle and then the other piece is the revenue side um, you know, we can, Bonnie, I'm sure you got the rates, right? Your new rates for 2022 in the last couple weeks, probably. It's in my email. <laughs> probably teeny tiny increase. And what the, what the state allows, it's highly regulated. What the state allows a um, EMS organization to bill is completely different from what they actually get paid. Often it's 10 cents on the dollar. You know, it says on your rate schedule from OEMS that you can bill $742 for an ambulance transport. But if it's a um, patient who has Medicare for their insurance, they're getting paid 10 cents on the dollar for that call. So that the number that you see, you know, EMS organizations allowed to bill by regulation has nothing to do. It's not a, a simple, oh, take that and multiply it by the number of calls they have per year. It has nothing to do with that. It's it's all dependent on the insurance companies and Medicare. And it's, it's really, really um, tough to see any improvement in that, in that revenue because, you know, you're, you're fighting a losing battle all the other you know payers in the healthcare system in the United States. So for comparison purposes, I mean we, we have nine regular first responders. Uh, in the past, what was our largest number? I mean I mean was when when there were a lot of volunteers, are we talking 20, 30? Rufus? Every time? <laughs> I forgot. I forgot when Rufus talk. was right when Rufus was younger and I was younger. <laughs> that was a bit, bit of a heyday. <laughs> when was the heyday? So, How many? Um, yeah, we we would have a. Uh, uh, there was the roster was in the twenties. Twenties, yeah. yeah, yeah. I think when I was EMS chief 16, 17 years ago, the number twenty six is coming to mind. Twenty six, and that was the years of EMTs before we were really using EMRs. 
And mm-hmm. now we don't even have 26 certified EMTs, not even that respond all the time, just certified. We don't even have that many. Really? But Glenn, I can't Glenn remember, also- but uh, under when I was ambulance chief, we went from the BLS status to ALS. And the only way we could do that was to have enough people take the additional training in order to be an ALS service. Um, we probably won't that, do that. You know, so I think we probably had, I would say 15 people taking the AL, you know, the, the secondary classes in order to do that. Hmm. Um, so we, that was we an additional had... 90 hours on top of the probably 130-ish just oh, to yeah. become a B, an EMT. Hmm. Well, it, if I could ask, uh, if if we were to go with this 224 number, um, that would invite the possibility of us, the possibility of us uh, not being able to stay under that number, depending on what happens. If it begins to appear as the the year begins to the end of the year begins to approach and we see we're going to go over 224 uh, is that problem resolved by um, a, a, a having a call a town meeting to allocate additional monies and is the twenty thousand dollar chunk part of that solution Is the twenty what twenty thousand dollar chunk? Uh, I'm I, I'm referring to a uh, a twenty a, I believe it was a twenty thousand um, dollar. Oh, you mean over expense? You know, if you oh, if the your budget goes over twenty thousand or whatever. That's what I yes. Um. So budget budgets are a guiding document. You know, you make your best guess as to what your expenses are going to be. And if there are emergencies that happen, the town will have to deal with that, you know. Um, so. And that that would we be the may, way we might can. have to go to the town, but, you know, we would still be have to cover. Um, you know, if if, if uh, the company that has to cover more shifts and then the costs go up we're we're gonna have to find the money for that so you know so if it's an and that would be one of the ways would to call be called to call a, a town meeting obviously we would keep you appraised of the financial trends and right concerns along the way but Okay. Right. And it would be an ongoing conversation with the board selectmen, board of finance, obviously. Yep. Okay. All right. So 224,000, that's the best case scenario. 224. Worst case, 492. Um, right. Okay. I don't know about best case scenario. I, I, Alan that's and following are... our current. Or, yes. Where we're. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Current Status. trend. Current trend. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, and again, so to, to clarify, if, if we can collectively work, and you guys sounds like are already working on other ideas, I could tell when you're talking about housing and income and jobs, and you know what I mean, all those things, they are direct factors into people that are able to be in the fire department and people that joined and had to leave because they had to find places to live, you know what I mean, that they could do those things. So they are a direct factor, again, that, that comes into play. Um, so, so yes, to, just to echo what they were saying, is that's our current staffing model. The Kent Volunteer Fire Department has no intention to stop that, you know, staffing model. Um, we, as John said, and, and as I think all three of you know, from some of you having done it, and Glenn, I don't know you well, but I can tell already how you have some pride here and uh, uh, for the town and, and so forth, um, regardless of what area it is, just like you heard people earlier from the library and, and and um, you know the the um, Swift House, you know all the other things that people have pride into this. So that's what it's about, and this is continues. And um, so we're looking at this under the current staffing model, uh, and 
where it's it's evolved. Um, but we the department felt very clearly as a whole because this went before the manage or the whole membership, not just um, you know the chiefs uh, of of uh, the department, and um, felt that it was very very important for you to see and should we should request in a budget number so the impact is there and you understand it so you as the board of selectmen you know then going to presenting your budget to the board of finance know that the number that we're talking about is huge you know when we if we have to go that route nobody wants to go that route nobody wants that i know of uh, nobody wants to go near that and we would hope that best case scenario would be significantly less than uh, 224 we really thought that best case scenario would be where we are now under our budget in that 104 area. You know what I'm saying with, with that? But as we explained, there's factors that came into play, like you know, um, that, that changed that. And if you'll remember um, a couple meetings ago, I gave you a, a report that said that we were trending this current year that we were gonna be over the budget. So we will be email meeting for the current year we're in. And we listed some of the factors and that's what's been taken into account in what this is going here. So I know that's not the focus of tonight's uh, meeting, but it parallels into on the budget where our current budget number was 104. That number is actually, as we're projecting, gonna end up um, at 154. So we'll be talking and sending you this in writing um, because now we've made a better projection over the next four months of where we go. Um, so we want you to, to know that for your comparison. And I was thinking of that, Glenn, when you were asking, uh, you know, I caught in about emergency management. You said, well, what's been the trend of this year, this year, you know, these past years and so forth. So, uh, you know, as this, as this moves forward. And I would really hope that, again, we would have a, a very good best case scenario and never have to, you know, and not have to go beyond this, this 224 but we just don't know. Um, and somebody said earlier about COVID and you know, sometimes I take that for granted that people understand that COVID has an impact on many things. Um, and you have Barbara you know, who came to our department and um, you know, as part of the, the, the committee that you have in the, the town to Barbara. gather information, Barbara Hurst. And um, so you know, she had asked and we gave her some, a bunch of information on that, but clearly EMS staffing from the volunteer standpoint was affected dramatically when COVID first hit and then for a while. And it still has some of our members that because of, of concern, health, uh, whatever, you know, all those things have not returned um, to doing regular shifts um, or returned to responding to shifts because of the, the COVID factor that's in there. I'm sure you can understand it. And I know Gene spoke about briefly about healthcare and all that. So we won't, I won't go off into those areas, but I just want you to know that it, did affect us directly. It affected us dramatically in my, using my words, my opinion, at the beginning when it first hit. Then as people, we got educated a little bit more, found out things, then some of those people were able to come back um, and start going on the shifts and, and so forth. But it really was a, a, a difficult time. Here's just a for example. Let's just say tomorrow, five people want to be first responders, five people show up, they can immediately help you tomorrow. What would, what would these numbers look like if that were to happen? I'd have to ask you how many shifts each week they would do, and then we would take that and calculate I mean, that out. So, but, so, but so, number so would no come short, down. yep. And, and in your case, so take example, in, in your scenario, let's say that um, one shift a week was covered. So you take the 3125 times six. I don't, I don't know, John, if you have your calculator, just to give him a number to work <laughs> on it. But, uh, um, but 3125 times six hours would yep. tell you how much we save um, for, from paying a thing. So, so even if it's not five people. 187.50. So $187.50 <laughs> for every, uh, you know, in that case. Now, stipends that we control in our budget, meaning from a dollar amount, if a stipend was paid, you know, it, it depends, it isn't always paid, but if it was, it would be $25 off of that. So okay. that's the, okay. the situation there. So Glenn, your point again is, I, I think is a very important point that just one shift is a huge, you know, adds up real fast and that's one per week, multiply yeah. that times 52 weeks. You see what I'm saying? And all of a sudden you've got thousands of dollars, um, you know, in there. I, I'll give you a, a maybe a, a better example that would uh, under our current year, 
when we lost one person that was doing six shifts a week, mm -hmm. that translated into a cost of just over 50,000, right around $50,000 to the staffing agency. Okay. Um, so that okay. one person going out translated into a $50,000 increase on the, on the, on the cost side of a per hour rate. So. No, no I, I understand much more now. Thank you. And All this. Yeah. Each, each new member that comes in untrained, you have to factor in at least a, a three to four month delay before they yeah. come online. If, if there's a course available right away within striking distance. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. And I, I just want to double check that the, the latter numbers that Alan was referring to is the projected deficit for this fiscal budget going in ending June, end of June is our projection that we'll be going over. And I don't think that is within the nature of the topic that we were yep. uh, anticipating to speak about, but I'm glad he mentioned that. So it's something we may need to return to. And Rufus, anything further? This has been, um, I think, a good learning process. I think all the departments, all library, you guys have really given us so much information. I'm very grateful for all of this time. We're, we're in here two and a half hours. <laughs> yeah. So, thank you all. Select thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Really I hit maximum somewhere here, but I heard you guys. <laughs> <laughs> we understand. <laughs> important. We'll, we'll important. Ourselves thank available you. again. Don't worry if you need it. So, uh, <laughs> you know, this is yeah, it's a lot to, to digest. Exactly. So with that it says it's 932. So we're going to go with that. Um, I appreciate everybody's time. And I think this was really um, time well spent. There's a little bit of snow apparently falling outside. So be careful no. anybody who's driving. I'm, Don't say I, that. I may be the only person Don't say driving. That. No, I'm driving back. I'm not staying. I can't stay here tonight. <laughs> you might see. All righty. Thanks, Thanks, everybody. Jean? Thank you. Yes. Jean, uh, do the three selectmen just have a couple of minutes that I could talk to you for a second? So, because we're on a, um, it's a special meeting, it has to. Um, oh, uh, it does have to do with with um, budget with, yes um, I just want to first of all apologize for not um, knowing that I was supposed to do a presentation I was asked to come and defend the budget um, so that I, I was looking for a question and answer and I didn't have a presentation prepared um, secondly Rufus to your question that you had asked about um, the worker slash uh, moderator um, no the moderator was not included in the 754 hours times $15 um, and that that is right underneath that um, that 754 hours and thirdly um, <laughs> I was given this budget worksheet form um, with the explanation of, with not much explanation at all. I was not told about the COLA being part of um, the typical rate increase. Um, so I know that now I know that this budget that workshop worksheet that I submitted to you um, was not what you were looking for. So my question to you is, would you like me to redo it um, in a financial information format rather than ours? Would it make more sense to you? There were on the worksheet, it was, um, there were, um, the finances were put in the worksheet. They were filled in. They were handwritten. Some of them. Oh, Some somebody of them. filled it in for us. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay. And, I don't. I don't have a copy of that. And Therese, you did a great job. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, no, you have nothing I, to I, apologize I, to us for. If you had said nothing, we would have 
walked away and said she prepped for that. They were all, everybody was really well prepared. Um, uh, I, and I felt I, it was very I, inadequate on my part. And I, I do apologize for that. I just didn't know that it was a presentation format. I, I have no issues with the conversation that we had with you all tonight. Okay, all. great. Wonderful. So then I, I don't, you don't need this redone at all. I don't think so. Cool. All Unless right. you want to practice this sir <laughs> <laughs> uh, Okay, wonderful. Thank you so very much. Thanks, Therese. Thank you. And it is now, Joyce, we're going to change that time to 9.35. And um, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. Yep. Second. All those in favor. Whatever. Thanks, everybody. Get home safe. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night.